you're listening to the Money Monopolizers Podcast, helping you take control of your financial destiny. It's about time that we invest more in our financial literacy and work towards building generational wealth. If you think you're ready to do the same, then you've come to the right place. Alex, Marlon, y'all ready? Let's get this bread. What's good, everybody? It's Alex Camuno here. We are back with episode 16 of the Money Monopolizers podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Marlon Walls. Marlon, how you doing today, bro? I'm doing good, bro. I'm really excited for this episode. I think this is a very important one as far as when you tra- are trying to get into real estate because we're going to be talking a lot about analyzing deals as opposed to like being, getting people on your team or all the prerequisites as far as getting to this point. This is like a pivotal point for um, you as far as having a successful real estate deal. So I think this is going to be a lot of useful information in this episode that p- people can take away from. How about you? I'm doing good, bro. I just got back from vacation. Um what last week or the end of last week and it's been bro that was an amazing vacation super fun we went to hawaii <clears throat> with someone homie so it was cool um we did a lot out there and that was like a week-long vacation so it was good to like you know take a break from this summer that was kind of like winding down the summer get get before we you know close out this year um we're trying to close out 2019 strong and go into 2020 real strong so that was a it was a good way to you know, kind of wind down and, or actually kind of, I guess before amping it up now, what we're going to do here for the rest of the year. So it's mm-hmm. cool. But um, yeah, other than that, uh, let's see what else. <clears throat> we finished demo on that house for uh, the one that we got out here. So we should be starting that. I get, well, I guess we'll be continuing that until it's finished and hopefully two months it'll be finished. But I don't know. We got some things that came up on that with foundation. So we're trying to get that taken care of. Um, but other than that, yeah, like you said, we got a great episode for y'all today. Um, we are talking, we're continuing our getting started investing in real estate series part five. Um, this is, we're going to be talking about analyzing a deal, like Marlon said. Um, and this is honestly, like if we're being real, this is, sorry, this is probably the, like if this is probably the, in this series, this is, I can, it's arguably the most important episode of this getting started investing in real estate series, right? Like this part, part five, analyzing a deal and understanding this is honestly like, you know, I think it will be the most important episode in this series. So if you don't, you know, if you listen to any of them, listen to this one, I guess. I would say obviously listen to all, all of them, but make sure you're paying attention to this one. Um, because honestly, in, in order to be like, you know, a successful real estate investor, you have to be smarter than most people. And that's something you got to know. You got to be smarter than most people. And what I mean by that is like, well, when we talked about it in like episode nine, right, when we talked about the key to being wealthy, I talked a lot about in there. The key is mainly what you know, because what you know is what's going to set you apart from everyone else, right? If you know more than most people, you have a more, more versatile tool belt, right? So you can do more things than most people. And in real estate investing, the best way to, you know, know more than most people and have a more versatile tool belt is by knowing how the numbers work um, in real estate. Because honestly, the 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 math is the most intimidating part of uh, real estate investing for a lot of people. But to be real, like this is having good math and bad math and knowing you know, or knowing how the numbers work and knowing how this operates is the difference between a flip or a flop in real estate. It's the difference between a good deal or a bad deal. This is the most important deal analysis is the most important subject in real estate investing, arguably. And I, I mean, I that's my in my opinion. But just because, I mean, if you're a real estate investor, your business is to, you know, flip or rent or whatever you're doing. You're 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 using real estate to make money, so you need to understand the ins and outs of it, right? You need to understand how your business is profiting. Like, if, for example, if I opened a car dealership, but I didn't know how car sales work, I'm not going to make money. So it's the same thing. You have to, I have to know that business inside and out to know how to uh, actually, you know, be successful. And a big part of that is knowing the numbers and how to analyze deals and how to look at deals. <clears throat> because, and you hear it all the time too, in real estate, you don't you make your money when you buy. You don't make your money, you know, when you sell your rent or when you rent. So if you don't have the math going into a deal, you already lost money. Cause it's like some it's a 
quote I seen from Grant Cardone. Uh, he's a big real estate guy, um, and he 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 always says, "If you don't know you made money on the day you bought it, it was a bad deal." And that's true, cause like <laughs> you gotta know going into it, it's a good deal, and the only way to know that is by having solid numbers. So I say all that to say this is an extremely, extremely, extremely important episode. Um, so if you do have any questions after listening to this episode, go back, listen to it again. And if you still have questions, ask us because, you know, this is extremely key. Yep. And I can't agree more. Like this is so pivotal with, with your success in real estate, because if you don't know how to analyze a deal, that means you will think anything is a deal when you uh, see one. So just understand just because somebody sends you like a lead. So say if, like you got a wholesaler or a, or a real estate agent who sent you a lead for a, a potential property that you could buy. doesn't mean it's a good deal automatically because it's available. Like say if um, they sent you a house that costs one hundred thousand dollars and needs, say, fifty thousand dollars of work. And it's going to appraise, meaning that once it's all fixed up and looking nice and, and uh, rehabbed, it's only going to appraise for one hundred and twenty thousand. You are all in for one hundred and fifty thousand. Like you spent that much money to have the deal and finish it up. And it's only worth one hundred twenty thousand. That's a terrible deal. You've lost thirty thousand dollars and you have to pay to sell it pretty much. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, we'll go a lot more in depth into that throughout this episode to understand what a good deal looks looks like versus a bad deal, but understand that you have to account for a whole bunch of different expenses besides just the purchase price and rehab because you're actually going to be in for more than that 150,000 when you allocate like a variable expenses that you may accrue holding costs. We'll get a whole bunch more into that later on, but <laughs> understand that it analyzing is so vital to you having a successful real estate deal but at the same time nobody wants to spend all day analyzing each and every deal like because deal analysis takes a lot of different numbers into consideration and if you get like 10 or 20 20 10 or 20 deals a day you're going to sit there all day just analyzing re um uh, what's it called potential uh, real estate deals nobody wants to do that so that's why we're going to show you the uh, through throughout this whole episode, how to analyze them uh, as, as, quick, as quickly as possible, rules of thumb that different investors use, and um, in order to be successful in real estate, and also understand that uh, no particular, no one area is alike. So, if you are investing in Cali versus investing in Indiana versus investing in Texas, your these rules may may vary just a little bit as far as feasibility. Yeah, definitely, and I'm that's what, I'm glad you mentioned all that because. What we the way we kind of are going to structure this episode, and um, we hope it won't run too long. But you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, but the way we're going to kind of structure it is, we're going to look at deal analysis for both flips and rental properties because we're essentially just going to be building off of what we've been doing in our series, right? Because we talked about in part one, we were talking about you know your goals and your, and then we talked about part two, your strategy and then property types and all that. So we in a lot in there, a lot of the things that we talked about was, uh, you know, flipping and renting. So we're going to, you know, structure this app episode analysis for flipping and renting. So, yeah, let's let's get into it, though. And also, before I before we get into it, you if you you might you know want to consider like just, you know, having a sheet of paper or something and being able to like write down some of the you know things that we talk about whenever, especially when we start getting into examples with numbers. Because it would be a lot easier to follow along. I'm just prefacing it before we get into it. So you can go ahead and grab that right now if you want to do that. Um, if not, then, you know, just try to follow along with us. But, you know, that would definitely help. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, let's get into it. We're going to start with a deal analysis. We're going to start looking at deal analysis from the perspective of a flip first and for flip deals. Right. So. It, w when it comes to flips, there's a lot of like newbie investors that ask me, like, how how do I know whether. I'm going to take on a certain flip. And in reality, what they're really asking is, how do I know if the numbers are going to work out in my favor? All right. That's the that's the that's the root of the question that they're trying to get to. Um, and it's honestly, it's it, every investor does it differently. There's every investor has a certain quantitative uh, analysis technique that they use. Right. Some use spreadsheets and complex formulas. And there are even some that use their gut feeling. I'm t like for me personally, I'm not a fan of either extreme. Um, my goal is to be able to analyze a deal in 30 seconds just by looking at the numbers. That's kind of what Marlon mentioned earlier. Just, you know, we use rule of thumbs and that kind of thing. Um, I don't need to sit here and, you know, be in a spreadsheet for hours to see if I'm going to do a deal or I'm not just going to say, oh, yeah, that feels like a good deal. I, I, I just want to analyze it in my head and uh, know that it's a good deal for me. So 
<clears throat> my goal with it when I'm looking at a flip, the I, I just need to know a few things, right? So I need to know number one how much my out of pocket cost will be. I need to know how much I have available for rehab based on the asking price of the deal, and then based off of that, uh, based off of you know my max amount that I have for rehab, I'll know the max I can pay for the property. If that don't make sense. Just keep listening. We're gonna kind of get more into that. So. Um, obviously the goal with a flip is to profit, right? That's the goal for everyone is to make profit. It's to flip, not flop. But for me, I don't necessarily think about the profit until later because the way I look at it, I look at things in terms of my return, right? Because I know if I can buy it with little to no out-of-pocket costs, my ROI is going to be great. ROI, return on investment. We're going to say mention that a lot in this episode. So return on investment is just pretty much the... Uh, um, percent of the money that you put in that you're going to be getting back right so that's what roi is. so if i know if i can the better my roi is the better the deal is for me um not uh, roi is key not necessarily the profit because i think about it like this would you invest dollars and make fifteen thousand? so that's 50 percent roi or invest five thousand and make ten thousand that, that, that's a hundred percent roi or even take it a step further you invest zero dollars and make a thousand that's infinite ROI. So think about that. We're going to kind of, you know, talk about that later in the episode and build off of that. But think about that. Ponder that. 50% ROI, 100% ROI, or infinite ROI. So I know if I can purchase the property with little to no out-of-pocket cost, I'm going to move forward with it. That's my goal with every deal. Yep, and that's a great way to get started because what you want to do when, you, when you're first looking at any potential deal, you want to figure out are you go, how much money are you going to be coming out of pocket? How much profit will you make? Like, and you want to be able to do that relatively quick. Like Alex said, he, you want to be able to analyze a deal within 30 seconds because if you're getting a large influx of deals coming in at a, uh, per day, you don't want to spend uh, <clears throat> ample amount of time, like 30 minutes per analysis, looking at one, each individual deal. It's just unrealistic, and that's going to just drive you out pretty much immediately from the real estate business. So um, I want to start mentioning a, a few rules of th- well, I guess for we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about it later for rentals uh, when we get there. But for flips, um, d- we have there's rules rules of thumbs that investors use when they are analyzing a deal or when they're looking at one to try to determine if it's even worth analyzing. So a big one, uh, this is to make sure that you don't lose money and make sure you make a, a profit on a deal is the seventy percent rule. And pretty much this is a quick way to see if a flip. Or if a deal is worth, uh, or it's going to be profitable as a flip. So simply put, it's pretty much the purchase price. You take the well in order to get, obtain the purchase price, you multiply the ARV, that's the after repair value, times seventy percent. That's why it's called seventy percent rule. And you subtract out the repairs, so it's seventy percent of the ARV minus the repairs. That's what you, and that ultimately gives you your purchase price of the home that that you can uh, that you need to purchase that in order to make it a good deal. It's like your your max purchase price. It, honestly, it's not very practical uh, to use in in every market because some markets it's like that's almost unfeasible. Like in Houston, if you're looking for a seventy percent deal, you might be looking for maybe two months, three months, a year because it's hard to find because of, mainly because of competition. But um, understand that this also is going to result in extremely low ball offers compared to what's probably currently on the market. Um, well, as far as what market is demanding for uh, houses that are like actually in good, in good condition. That's why you had to look for distressed houses. With distressed houses, you can uh, offer lower uh, prices and you might be able to negotiate something with the seller because uh, you have to tell them that I can't. Nobody's going to buy something from somebody that is that distressed, and they they pretty much have to come down on their asking price at the, at the end of the day. Uh, I guess to, just for an example, uh, imagine if you uh, had a house that cost a hundred well, that was going to appraise for one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and you took so now let's, look, let's run a seventy percent rule on the, that on that case. So one hundred twenty thousand dollars times uh, 0. 0.7, that equals eighty four thousand. Now subtract out the um, repairs. I would just say that you need fifty thousand dollars in repairs. If you need fifty thousand dollars in repairs and the ARV is only one hundred twenty thousand, that means the highest and best offer I can make is thirty four thousand dollars. You're probably not gonna find a lot of people that's gonna be asking that's gonna ask thirty four thousand dollars for something that's gonna be worth one hundred twenty thousand dollars once it's fixed up. But if it needs fifty thousand dollars of work, they don't have many options at that point. So. 
um, that's that's pretty much what you had to tell them. This is the highest and best offer I can go based off of the rehab that's needed uh, for uh, um, f- f- on the house itself. And yeah, that's 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 good point too because I mean you got to know who has the leverage in the situation, right? So if I'm a seller and I have I own a property that you know is worth one hundred twenty thousand, but it needs fifty thousand dollars worth of work, and I don't have the fifty thousand dollars to put into it, I don't have the leverage. They they had a leverage in that situation because they're the ones that can you know, they're the ones that had the money to take the property off of my hand, right? But yeah, um, yeah, the seventy percent rule that's like the the golden standard, I guess, when it comes to flips in real estate, right? So so why well why is it why do we classify as a seventy percent though? So the re- reason that we say seventy percent or in real estate the reason we keep we say seventy percent. Um, is because in theory, if you can purchase a house and repair it all for 70% of what it's worth, you're most likely going to make a decent profit to sell, depending on the area that you're in, right? Um, like Marlon was saying, it's not going to work in every market. Cheap states like Louisiana or you know Oklahoma, you can make it work at maybe 65%. But in expensive states, you may have to go up as high as 85% just because you're gonna. it costs a lot more to be all in. So in California, purchase prices are a lot higher. Um, repair costs are, I mean, you can assume that that's uniform all across the country. The cost to just assume that it's uniform. But the purchase prices are the things that are variable. You're not buying a house for the same price in Louisiana as you are in California. So you're going to have to <laughs> be in higher percentage. So, but I mean, here in Texas, 70% is, you know, pretty, you can, you can make 70% work here depending on uh, the type of property you're trying to get. <clears throat> but yeah, the, the the biggest thing to know about this whole rule of thumb or this guideline, the seventy percent rule, it's really dependent on the ARV and the rehab estimate being accurate. If you don't have those two things, <laughs> like accurate, I mean, you might as well just go off of gut feeling then, because it'll be <laughs> the same thing. Because if you overestimate the ARV, you're gonna pay too much, and if you underestimate the rehab, you're gonna pay too much. Because remember, it's all it, it, it's seventy percent of. The ARV. You need to be all in for seventy percent of the ARV. So that's why the ARV, knowing the correct ARV and determining the correct ARV is so key. And honestly, it's determining ARV is a skill that you have to develop and practice. It's not something you just know. Um, and most even agents and struggle with coming up with accurate ARVs. It's not something that just you just know. But I kind of want to talk about just real quick how you kind of come up with an ARV. I'm not going to get too in detail into the ARV just because this is not about that. This is more so about deal analysis. So for the purposes of that, I'm just going to talk about the, uh, you know, how to find it real quick. But typically what happens is either an agent or, you know, yourself, you can do a what's called a CMA. A CMA is a comparable market analysis. This is pretty much where you just go are finding similar properties that have sold for, um, you know, certain amounts and they're, you know, they have similar characteristics to your subject property. And you're trying to, based off of those properties, you're trying to determine what your property will be worth, right? Because that's how residential real estate works. Properties values are based off of similar properties, otherwise known as comps. So typically they'll do a comparable market analysis, the agent uh, will or something. And that's how you determine what your ARV is. Um, so, like I said, I'm not going to get too much into that. That's really all I'm going to say just because <laughs> this is not about that. So, for the purposes of this episode, moving forward, we'll just assume that our ARVs, when we start talking about examples, are going to be accurate, right? We're going to assume that that's the ARV, the true ARV. And the same thing with rehab costs. We we talked about rehab costs in, a, uh, I think it was a previous real estate episode, which is two ago. But estimating rehab costs is probably the toughest part about real estate investing. It's the hardest job because... There's so many, un, uh, you know, variables that can come up and that you just can't account for until you actually start repairing houses. So honestly, if unless you're a contractor yourself, don't even try to do this yourself, especially in the beginning. Just go ahead and, you know, get hired out to a contractor to get you a bid for your rehab um, and use that bid and go from there. Just make sure they're good contractors. We talked about finding a contractor in uh, that last episode when we were talking about building your team a few episodes ago. So go listen to that and listen to when we were talking about contractors if you want to uh, know how to find a good contractor. Um, 
But like I said, same thing. For the purposes of this episode, when we start doing examples, we'll just assume that rehab costs are accurate um, for the purposes of the example. So I kind of want to tie all that in together with the financing aspect of this whole thing. So depending on how you finance deals is going to determine on how you buy them. So for me, I, right now I'm using hard money to finance deals. So hard money lenders, they lend with the hard asset as collateral. We talked about that in that episode too. Go check that out if you aren't familiar with hard money lenders. But they pretty much lend based off of the asset. That's, or based off of the hard asset. That's the collateral in the deal. So what I want to do now is kind of go into an example deal um, so that we can tie all this together and see how we'll approach a potential deal, how we'll analyze a potential deal. So let's, and this is when, this is when your paper will come in handy now. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> get out, so break, let's, break out your phones for notes or get out a piece of paper or something. Facts, facts. Because we might get a little bit into the weeds. But, so let's say we got 123 Main Street, right? We got it from a wholesaler. So 123 Main Street, the wholesaler is asking 55000 for it. So that's your asking price. And we'll say the ARV on the house is 130000 So that's your ARV. Um, and we'll say the rehab estimated repairs are about 45,000. So we're, we're going to use a hard money lender on this deal. So a hard money lender is going to give us terms of, they're going to say, Hey, okay, we'll lend you 70% of the LTV. So 70% of the LTV, LTV is loan to value. So they're going to pretty much lend you 70% of the value of the house. So they're giving you 70% of the ARV to, to do whatever, to buy the house and also repair it. So that's their terms. So, and they're also going to say, okay, you're going to pay me 10% interest every month while you're repairing this house and while you have before until you pay back this loan, right? And then they'll also say, you'll pay me two points up front. Two points, we talked about those in the previous episode. Also, those points are just the uh, percentage of the loan that they're going to give you, right? So, two points, you have to pay them 2% of the loan in fees. So, right off the bat, I know that I need to get this property for 46000 not 55,000, right? That way I can be all in for 70% of the ARV cuz I don't want to buy I if I was to buy the property for 55,000, I'm already I'm already coming out of pocket cuz the lenders are only giving me 70% of that LTV. So if they're only giving me 70% of that 130, I 70 I need to buy the property for 46 and rehab it for 45. That way I'm in for 70%. So that way I'm not coming out of my pocket, right? That's the whole goal. So the hard money lender is going to give me 70, 30. So he'll give me 91,000 to purchase the house. So if, like I said, if I get the property for 46,000, I have no money out of pocket. So what does that mean? Infinite ROI, right? ROI is the, you know, your, your benefit over cost. So it's the amount you are going to make over the amount you put in. So let's just, for now, let's say, or, or let's remember what remember what we were talking about earlier too. Whenever I was talking about ROI, so that's really what that's what the, that's one of the reasons I said remember that. Let's say the wholesaler. Let's say the wholesaler is only going to uh, come down to fifty fifty thousand from fifty five, right? So that means I have to come up with the other four thousand dollars because the lender is only giving me ninety one, but I need ninety five, right? Are y'all following along with what I'm saying? The lender, I'm just trying to maybe I'm dumbing it down too much but i'm just trying to make sure everyone is following along if they're only going to give me 70 percent of the 130 right that means they're only going to give me ninety one thousand. but the the wholesalers now is only going to come down to fifty thousand, not the forty six thousand. so that means I'm, i need to come out of pocket for the rest right so that's going to decrease my roi which is fine if the ri is still good enough but that's kind of uh how it's going to go so that's kind of how you approach the deal in the beginning. But before, the next step will be really determining the profit because, I mean, everything else is pretty much set in stone. But before we determine what a profit is, we need to figure out what the fixed sales cost will be so that we can also, you know, tie that into our true ROI, right? Because that's part of the uh, equation also. So fix, when I say fixed uh, sales cost, those are pretty much, you know, the fees that are going to be associated with uh, selling the property when you when you flip it. So... With fixed sales costs, you got your fixed costs, which are like your various fees, commissions, and costs associated with it that are just outside. Those are the ones that are outside of the rehab costs. And then you have your purchase costs, which is when you the, the cost associated when you buy it. So you have closing costs, which you can go look at that up. This is not I'm not going to get into that, but you have closing costs, 
Um, you have your lender fees. Um, and th those are like the points and the origination fees and stuff like that whenever you're closing on the house. And then you, the other type of fixed costs are going to be your holding costs. So holding costs are just the costs that occur between the purchase close and the sell close. So some of the holding costs, and there's a bunch of them, but some of them are your mortgage payment or your principal or interest payment, right? Remember, I said that the hard money lender in this example that he's he's gonna he's gonna make us do ten percent uh, interest only payments every month, right? So that's part of your holding costs. While you're rehabbing the property, I gotta pay him ten percent of the loan. Um, then you also have your utilities. Um, then you have your insurance, and those are a few of them. I'm not gonna get into all of them, but those are the few holding costs you're gonna have. <clears throat> and then, obviously, whenever you sell the property, you're gonna have costs associated with that. You're gonna have to pay commissions, uh, three percent to each agent, the bot the selling agent the listing agent, or the buyer's agent and the seller's agent and you're gonna have to pay closing closing costs again because in this market buyers are usually asking <laughs> you know sellers to pay closing costs just because the market costs for that right now so the way we don't we don't we don't really typically account for these whenever we you know marlon and i whenever we uh us, like analyze deals we don't typically really look at this but it is technically part of your roi um, so for now, let's for, for our example, let's assume that we have fifteen thousand in fixed costs. So write that down too, if you are writing this down. So now, after you know all that, um, we can calculate what our profit would be now, and then determine an ROI uh, based off of that. So Marlon, what based off of all this, what would our profit be? Okay, so I pretty much ran all these numbers through a spreadsheet, and I actually will upload this same spreadsheet up onto moneymonopolizers.com. So if you want to check out for yourself, you can go to moneymonopolizers.com slash analysis, and you'll be able to also input your own numbers into your the spreadsheet, so that way you can be able to do it for yourself, like on another deal. This would be your personal deal analysis spreadsheet. Um, but just in general, I ran the numbers on this one and we came out to a t grand total of eight thousand two hundred seventy three dollars in profit. And that's basically saying that after one month of basically uh, real estate or uh, flipping work. So say you did, did one month of um, rehab, you came out with with this total for um, like in profit. So that's a pretty, a pretty good deal for one month. I don't know how many people are making eight thousand a month, but that's a yeah. solid, good, pr pretty good return on your uh, time, I would say. Yeah. But uh, I would say this example is more so just to show a proof of concept or just show how a deal will work, how how, to, how analysis will work. It's probably yeah. impractical to to both rehab, do a fifty thousand dollar rehab, and to uh, sell it all within one month. But it's just showing you. Um, what you can make so you actually could also can change the number of months that the rehab will take in the calculator so that that's also going to be included and i would say more in general you might want to say like three two or three months for the rehab and the um sale of the property but i want to say all this to say when you first start analyzing the deal it may seem scary at first like you may not know exactly all the numbers to, to input but over time as you continue to do it you become more comfortable and then it's basically like how people always say practice makes perfect now with with this you practice makes perfect and you build confidence in your ability to know what a good deal looks like and understand like if you have to if, like by, by at this point for me personally i see like 15 deals per day and you i promise you you don't want to you don't want to put each one of those deals through this calculator or th through the spreadsheet that i just uh that, that we just talked to you about you want to use those rules of thumb that i mentioned earlier like that 70 percent rule that's what that's something that you want to use before you do this analysis that way you know just from looking at it like is this even worth my time to even analyze further because you don't you don't want to analyze every single deal but in the beginning you might just want to get the practice but yeah. once you start getting up there as far as doing more deals you don't want to be analyzing every deal that comes into your inbox it's way too it's way too much way too much time spent and it's going to really just drain you uh mentally i promise that and also remember this, no one deal is going to make you rich because I think that's a problem with a lot of people is that they want to make sure that they have every deal perfect, making like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 off of one deal. And in reality, your first deal, you may not make anything. You may just break even. But it's OK, because at the end of the day, that was, that's like your learning experience. That's like you paying for your education. Almost you you're going to pay somehow Either you can pay some uh, type of guru that's going to charge you twenty thousand dollars for their classes. Or you can break even on a real estate deal that's going to teach you a lot more because you're learning by experience. And even even if you lose money on it, big deal. Like you said, it wasn't going to make you rich anyway. Even if you made 
twenty thousand off of it. It wasn't gonna make you know, it wasn't gonna make you rich. So if you lose money, it's a big deal. Yeah, you don't want to lose money, but it happens. It's gonna happen in your in your real estate investing career. You will lose money. So consider it tuition to the school of hard knocks. Anyways, uh let's let's now look at rental property analysis. So that was flipping analysis. So like you said, that spreadsheet will be on the website, www.moneymonopolizer.com. Yeah, just go there, you know, go find it on the website. Um, and then you can kind of play with that calculator and manipulate it to just see how stuff kind of works and how the numbers work. And um, yeah. So yeah, let's get into the rental property analysis though. So with rental properties, analysis is a lot different. Um, it's what well, I guess the process is a little different. It's not, analysis itself isn't too much different, but the process is uh, kind of different. So with rental properties, as we have talked about, like in episode, I guess, part two of the series and part one, we were talking about, you know, when I talked about the wealth generators of real estate, um, cash flow and appreciation were two of the biggest ones, right? Those are probably the two biggest ones. Um, so with rental properties, those are, for me, those are the two most important factors whenever I'm analyzing a rental property. I need it to cash flow and I need it to appreciate, right? So cash flow, what is cash flow? Cash flow is the money remaining after paying all expenses, right? So cash flow, in a sense, is what's going to create your, your freedom. This should be your primary objective with rental property. Appreciation is the equity gained as the property value increases, right? So the appreciation to me is what really creates the true wealth in real estate. This is where you, you know, create equity and this is where you're gaining those, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of wealth. Um, cash flow is going to give you the freedom and the time freedom, but appreciation is going to create your wealth, right? And if you buy properties right, they're going to appreciate. Um, just go listen to episode 11 for the types of properties that you should be buying uh, to take advantage of appreciation, right? But for the purposes of you know this analysis, we're going to focus on cash flow because, like I said, if you buy them right, appreciation will come. So we're going to focus on cash flow. So let's dive into that. So cash flow is, like I said, it's the money remaining after you pay all your expenses, right? So your, your income minus your expenses. Knowing what's exactly is, knowing what is exactly classified as your income and your expenses is extremely key, right? You have to know those to a T, especially the expenses. But for the income, income is pretty straightforward. Income is the rent that you're going to get from the tenants, right? So the key thing here is just knowing the far, fair market rent. Um, that's just pretty much the price someone is willing to pay to use your property. And you can really find this easily. All you got to do is check Zillow for the area, see what things are renting for. You can go to websites like uh, rentometer.com. Um, you just put, you know, the property address and uh, the number of bedrooms and it'll give you like the market rent for a certain, you know, uh, square mile radius in that area. Mm -hmm. So that's really put pretty much all you got to do for that. Um, the, th the, th the big thing here is the expenses, right? So the expenses are the key thing because <laughs> this is where people get messed up, but not they underestimate their expenses when it comes to rental properties. So expenses are just Pretty much anything you have to pay with the income. You use the income to pay the expenses. Um, underestimating expenses is the difference between you owning an asset and a liability. If you underestimate your expenses, then what they truly are, you will be paying to own that property, which you don't want to do. So going into it, you need to make sure you're accounting for every single expense. So that's where we kind of want to get into here so that we can kind of help you understand and know and teach what these expenses are and what they look like. In theory, a lot of people think, well, oh, my mortgage is a thousand dollars and my rent is fifteen hundred. So my cash flow is five hundred. That's wrong. <laughs> mortgage my, or <laughs> rent minus mortgage is not cash flow. You're you're leaving out tons of expenses. With expenses, the, the two biggest ones that you're going to have, you're going to have your fixed expenses and you're going to have your variable expenses. Fic fixed expenses are pretty much your mortgage, so your principal and interest, taxes, your insurance, uh, utilities like water, sewer, garbage, gas, electric, HOA, uh, lawn care, etc. Those are fixed expenses, things that are going to be pretty much, you know, you can estimate that they'll be the same every month. Um, and then you have your variable expenses. So your variable expenses are things that vary like <laughs> from time to time just because I mean it's not uniform. So these include things like uh repairs, vacancy, capital expenditures and property management. So variable expenses are based on a percentage 
of the income that you want to set aside for those things, right? So I'll just kind of talk about a few that I mentioned. So vacancy, that, that's an amount you set aside to cover mortgage payments between tenant turnover, right? So, so this is really mainly de- the amount that you choose to set aside is dependent on the area and the type of vacancies that you're, or the amount of vacancies that you can expect to have in that area. Other areas have higher vacancies than others. Typically, you can assume 5% um, of your income will go to vacancies. So we'll say 5% for vacancies. Repairs, um, this is amount an amount set aside for repairs that may come up while you're leasing to this person, right? So leaking pipe, broken toilet, cracked window, those are anything that can happen. And these are t- the amount you should be setting aside is really dependent on the age of the property and the items within it, right? But typically, if you assume anywhere between 5 to 12%, depending on the uh, age and the condition of the property, you'll be good. Um, and then you have capital expenditures. So capital expenditures, um, which we usually call CapEx, these are, you know, the um, it's, it's an amount set aside for a replacement of like those big ticket items, right? So you have like your water heater, your roof, your HVAC, flooring, all those kind of things. Those are big tip, big ticket items. And like repairs, this is also dependent on the age and condition of the property. So, but if you assume eight to twelve percent, you'll usually be good here. Um, and one thing to know about this too is that unless the property is a new construction, you cannot. A lot of people try to ignore capex, but you can't ignore capex. <laughs> unless the property is a new construction, you can't ignore it um, because it's crazy. Because if just imagine like if you were earning a hundred dollars a month in cash flow every month for ten years. And then all of a sudden you need a new roof and an HVAC system that costs you twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> so now <laughs> that that twelve thousand that you just earned in cash flow over those ten years it just got wiped out by the twelve thousand dollars of expenditures that just hit you. <laughs> and another thing that's key to know here also is that the lower the property value is, the larger portion of the income that your capital expenditures will take. So. What that pretty much means, let's say, for example, that you have a $500,000 house and you have a $50,000 house. So the $500,000 house is 10 times more expensive than the $50,000 house, right? 50 times 10 is 500. So, but just because one house is 10 times more expensive, that doesn't necessarily mean that the roof, the water heater, uh, you know, all these items are going to be 10 times more expensive, right? It's not, it doesn't scale linearly with that. So just keep that in mind with that. I mean, I want to I want to make it just an emphasis on how important cap uh, uh, saving up for these capital expenditures and all these variable expenses are, because um, I don't know you're saying like, say, five and 12 percent. I want to just reiterate that those percentages are basically um, percentage of each monthly rent. So yeah. if he's when he's saying five to 12 percent, that's saying so the rent is a thousand dollars. You want to say five to 12 percent of that in whatever category he's referring to, whether there's capex, repairs, maintenance or whatever. But um, I also want to I think. It would be re- really good here to like give our personal examples because we've had expenses come up that fit, fit into these variable expense categories. I know you have plenty of examples, but I would <laughs> say for me, since my home is f- built in 1961, it, to, uh, to just going to how the age of the home, you're looking at a home that's over uh, 40 years old now. Maybe I think it's over, over 50. So yeah, 50, 58 years old. Uh, it's a pretty old house, so you're bound to have some variable expenses pop up, which I have. So for instance. Um, I had a fa- uh, one of my faucets was ha- having a leak and I ended up having to get the uh, pipes repaired uh, b- behind the shower. And that's just something that pops up. It's about I think it was like a six to seven hundred dollar expense. And that's just something that pops up and something you have to account for uh, by having those variable expenses. So I just want, want to emphasize that importance. Yeah, I, uh, that's <laughs> key too. very, very, very important, because I remember whenever I first bought this property last year, <laughs> Last year, oh my God, I was getting cooked by these capital expenditures, bro. I remember the tenants moved in in October, and it hadn't even been two weeks, and uh, the power went out, and I was mm-hmm. like, "Oh shoot!" You remember that whole catastrophe? But um, <laughs> they, it turns out the property was freaking, you know, all the wiring or you know the the panel was un- pretty much the panel was undersized, and some of the uh, things on the exterior panel too were undersized too um for all the you know appliances that were running because the garage got converted so it added appliances Mm -hmm. so that pretty much made the panel undersized for you know the property and uh the tenants moved in and boom within a few days they didn't have any power and 
What that mean for me? I mean, I'm the landlord. I got to take care of that. So what does that mean? I had to get a new panel. How much did that cost me? Two thousand and two hundred dollars. <laughs> so you know, and I'm not saying that to scare you, but look, once you get into this, make sure you, it's good also to have some you know cash in reserves mm-hmm. that, so that especially in the beginning, because if something like that happens, like if I wouldn't if I wasn't able to pay for that, oh man, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. That would have been bad. I don't even know what happened, but that would have been bad. So it definitely had that, you know, in mind. And saving for that is key and not to skip out on that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then the the last variable expense, too, that I'm going to mention is the property management. So property management is the amount you're going to pay, you know, someone to manage your tenants, right? This is, you know, you can think of this as your freedom price. Because <laughs> once someone else is, this is probably... Once you get into, you know, rental properties, the income is supposed to be passive. And to truly have mm-hmm. passive income, you have to be removed from, you know, management. So by paying someone to manage for you is uh, what's going to give you your freedom. Um, so, yeah, the rate for this is typically different in every area, but usually they charge 8 to 12 percent of the monthly rent and then a one time fee of 50 percent of the first month's rent just to actually get tenants in place and stuff so and and one thing that's key also here to know um is that even if you plan to manage the property yourself you should still budget for property management because you're not going to manage the property forever unless you really want to manage it forever then that's (laughs) but i don't want to manage the property forever i want to at some point have it in property management so going into the deal i need to know that it's going to work with the property manager in place right so that's kind of how you should be approaching that so those are the those are the primary variable expenses. I kind of wanted just to talk about those just so that you're aware of them, because I don't know if we're going to really ever touch on them again in this series. So just so that you are aware of them. All right. And yeah, I mean, that's a whole bunch of good points. And I think just to emphasize on the property management in particular, you want to, like you always say, you want to uh, start off with the end in mind. So when you go into any deal, you want to start off thinking, I don't want to be managing this when I am uh, 20 years from down, down the line, because um, I want this to be a passive investment. I don't want this to be something that I have to continue to have as another job. I don't want to be a property manager. I want to be the passive investor that's just collecting the income check. That's all. I, as an investor, that's what you want to do because you're, you're looking for time freedom. You're not looking for more cash, but more work at the same time. So just think about that when, when you're talking about uh, uh, accounting for all of these variable expenses. Yeah. And uh, just to... To relate to what we talked about with the flips, even investors also used uh, different r- rules of thumb in order to determine if a rental is a good deal or not. And I just want to uh, talk about a couple of those. So starting out would be the one percent rule. So the one percent rule is essentially just taking the um, the value of the home, the ARV of the home, and then multiplying by one percent, so 0.01, and that's basically telling you what the if the rent can be equal to or more than 1% of the value of the home that's basically them saying that this would be a, this would be a good investment that's just that doesn't work in all areas like like we always say but it's a good rule to look at it's just, some areas it actually might be 2% that might work for you like you may be able to get up to 2% but in general if 1% of the if 1% of the ARV of the home is c- capable of being garnered in rent per month then um, it's probably a good investment and then so you're, I also, saying, so you're saying like, oh, sorry. So you're saying like a hundred thousand, a hundred, a home worth a hundred thousand should be able to rent for a one thousand, right? Yep, it, that's exactly it. So if I if I have a hundred thousand dollar house, or well, that, that in the ARV, I w- I would definitely want to find a house. Or I want to find rent that can be half or one for a thousand dollars per month, yeah. and that's really the goal with that. And that's how you can almost know that this would probably be a good investment. Yeah, as far as a rental. And then another one will be the 50% rule. This one is when you t- take the, your monthly income, so say that $1,000, you subtract off 50% uh, for expenses. That's where the 50% comes from. So now you have 500, then minus the P&I, the principal and interest. And, that, w- and if that, that will equal your cash flow. If that's a positive number, that means that this might be a good investment as well. And that that's we're trying to uh, show you what your cash flow is going to be. Essentially, it's not completely accurate, but it's a good rule of thumb to follow just to track and, and gives you like a ballpark figure. Yeah. And uh, those expenses are what Alex was ta- talking about earlier, those fixed and variable expenses. So the fixed would be in the utilities, the uh, insurance and taxes, not the P&I, the, the, the principal and interest like the mortgage itself. That's not included. 
because uh, you subtract that out later on. But the variable expenses also um, are included in that 50%. That's where the, that's where the number the 50 is coming from. That's what it's comprised of. The CapEx, repairs, maintenance, property management, all that's included. So I guess using the same example as Alex mentioned earlier with the $100,000 house, if um, you have the rents that are at $1,000, um, and say that you put that, so you can't just have the whole home. Uh, you don't. You don't have the whole hundred thousand dollar loan. So imagine if you're going to buy a hundred thousand dollar house and put say twenty percent down, and that means you uh, you have a loan at eighty thousand dollars, and uh, just say that it's like four percent interest. So now you have a P, uh, principal and interest. That's uh, the mortgage itself is three hundred eighty dollars. Uh, so now we're going to put all that into the calculator. That I, that uh, well, we're going to put all that into this equation for um the 50 percent rule so you take your monthly income it's a thousand dollars minus 50 percent of that um rent which would be a uh, 500 so a thousand minus 500 and then subtract off the pni the uh, principal and interest that's minus 380 that gives you a total cash flow per month of 120 dollars and so that's a positive cash flow that means that this is probably going to be a good rental it depends on now it depends on who you ask as well as far as what they're looking for per rental some people may be looking for two hundred dollars per month some people may look for a hundred so it could fit somebody's qualifications it could not but that's basically saying that you get so multiply that 120 times 12 that's another fourteen hundred forty dollars per year and so that's and that's just off of one rental. Imagine having like 10 of those. Now you're looking at fourteen thousand dollars. So that's just how that's how you um start. That's how you want to think about it with the 50 percent rule. That's a, a cash flow type analysis. It doesn't get into like other important metrics. Because there's many more things you want to look at when you're talking about rentals as far as what metrics. Well, as far as um, what you consider a good deal versus a not. That's just essentially looking at cash flow only. Mm hmm. So. <clears throat> Look, that's if it's go back and listen to that. If it was, you know, <laughs> you thought that was a lot to follow, just go back and listen to it. It's cool. Um, but yeah, what we're going to do now is kind of get into an example deal like we did for the uh, flip and, you know, run through that. So, yeah, if I like, you know, if you had a pen and paper, go ahead and pull it out again. This is a good time to do it because we're this will probably even be more so in the weeds than earlier because it's a little bit you know, deeper analysis for rentals than it is for flips. But so, yeah, let's do an example. So let's say we have 321 Main Street, right? Everybody lives on Main Street. So we got a, uh, let's say that we it's a triplex that's been on the MLS for 100 days, right? So <clears throat> the asking price on the triplex is 300000 But since it's been sitting for 100 days, let's say that we can negotiate it down um, to 285000 right? So... For the purposes of this, let's assume that we're going to put a 20% down payment of $57,000. 20% of two eighty-five dollars um, is fifty-seven. dollars So we'll say that, that our down payment will be $57,000. Um, we'll pay closing costs of $3,500. Um, repairs for the property because it needs some repairs, let's say $15,000. Pre-rent holding costs, we'll say, you know, that's the time before you get the property rented out that you're paying for, you know, the mortgage and stuff. Let's say twenty eight hundred. So the total cost to purchase this property would be fifty would be fifty seven thousand plus thirty five hundred plus fifteen thousand plus twenty eight hundred. So that's going to total come up to seventy eight thousand dollars and three hundred or seventy eight thousand three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and before you start thinking, oh, I don't have seventy eight thousand dollars to buy this house. We're just I'm just doing it for the purposes of this example. Um, I, we're in the future episode when we start talking about financing. We're gonna, you know, talk about ways to finance where you don't have to put twenty percent down because I know most people don't have seventy eight thousand dollars to put on a triplex on Main Street. So we're gonna talk about that in a future episode, strictly about financing and talk about creative finance. So <clears throat> let's talk about the income. So the in income on the property, we're gonna say that market rent for each of the units in the triplex is twelve hundred dollars. So there's three units. So that means total you'll be getting $3,600 a month in rental income. So your mortgage on the property is going to be the price you paid minus your um, down payment, right? So you pay $285 minus $57. That'll be $228. So you're going you're gonna to have a, two, a mortgage of $228,000, let's say, amortized over 30 years at 4%. So that's going to give you a principal and interest of $1,090. Mm -hmm. So that's your P&I. Let's talk about more so about more of the expenses. So let's say the taxes are $8,000 a year. 
So total, that's going to be 670. This is in Texas, by the way. So <laughs> that's why the tax taxes. Yeah, that's why the taxes are so high. So let's say $8,000 a year, which is $670, $670 a month. So you can, it, by the way, you can find the tax rate, you know, on your county tax uh, assessor website and you can go see what tax rates are in your area. Um, so yeah, let's say the insurance on the property will be 150 a month, uh, vacancy at 5% of your vacancy is going to be 5% of your rental income. So that'll be 180. Um, your repairs are going to be 5% of your rental income. So that's another 180 and your capital expenditures will be 5% of, uh, your rental income, which is another 180. And then for property management, we'll just say that it'll be $300 a month. Um, so your total monthly expenses are going to come out to 2570 right? So if you're following along, that's where you should be. 2570 is your monthly expenses. So now we can calculate our cash flow. We have our income and we have our expenses. So income minus expenses equals cash flow. So our total income was 3600 and our total expenses was 2570 So that gives you a cash flow of $1,030. Wow. So you're making $1,030 every month off of this house literally you're just making a thousand and thirty dollars every month you're not even managing it you're not gonna you're not because you pay for property management you're not doing anything you're literally just making this money in your sleep that's the goal right yes it is so but is that a good deal honestly it depends on who you ask because for me i need to see what the cash on cash return on investment is so cash on cash return on investment is just pretty much it's a return it's the amount of cash you're getting back based off of the cash that you put in. It's strictly looking at the cash and the money um, involved. And usually this is annualized for the first year. So let's look at what our cash on cash return on investment would be. So like I said, it's the amount earned over your amount invested. So we're going to annualize this over the full year. So let's say we're, we said we're earning $1,030 a month, right? So multiply that times 12 and divide that value by the total cash invested, which was our 78300 and that will give you a percent return. So if you do that math, you're going to get 15.78% return. So what that means is this property will return 15.78% of your money in the first year. That is a great deal to me. Great, great deal. So because honestly, you can compare this to like the S&P 500, which is, you know, the it's pretty much the stock market. It's the largest, uh, the, the largest 500 companies in the stock market. Uh, that have stocks and that's those are the, that's the return that they're getting typically over the last 30 years the best you've gotten from this was between seven to eight percent so if you're talking 15.78 percent within the first year only that is a great deal in my opinion but there are other factors to still take into account that's gonna you know actually increase your return on investment your 15.78 is just the cash on cash return which is just strictly looking at cash not, not looking at all the other factors. So one thing to know with that is that in each year, because of amortization, your annualized return is increasing every year. So your your when I say amortization, right, your loan is being paid down every year. And also your expenses are decreasing and your rent is increasing. Well, your expenses might not be decreasing, but your rent is increasing. Um, well, I guess technically your mortgage is an expense and that's decreasing. So your that's going to, in a sense, decrease your expenses and also your rent increases with just over time rent increases. So that's increasing your return, right? You're manipulating the equation. You're increasing the uh, numerator and decreasing the denominator. That's going to increase or that's going to give you a higher percentage. So that's one factor. The, the, another factor that's also going to increase or that's also going to help with your return is the fact that you're rehabbing the property. So now you're getting, you know, increase in your appreciation and your equity just from that rehab alone right so let's assume i mean for purposes of like figuring out this return this new return let's assume that the property is going to be worth three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars after you initially rehab it so it's worth thirty thousand dollars more than you paid remember you paid 285 and let's say now after you rehab it it's worth three hundred and fifteen thousand on top of that let's assume that there is two percent of natural appreciation every year right so that means after five years, it's going to be worth approximately $345,000. So let's take all those things into account. You take your your uh, decrease in expenses and your increase in, uh, in income, and then you take your appreciation and the equity gain from that, and you can 
And also on top of that, don't forget you're cash flowing every year. So let's for the purposes of this, let's assume that the property you're going to hold the property for five years and then sell it for whatever for the new value of three hundred forty five thousand dollars after those five years. Because remember, I said it's in, it's appreciating two percent every year. So let's say you're going to hold it for five years and then sell it. So for those five years, you remember, you're still cash flowing. So if you're assuming that the cash flow is the same every year, which it won't be, it's actually increasing. You're going to make around thirty thousand thirty thousand dollars just from those five years of holding the property just from cash flow alone. So combine those, you know, factors, combine all those factors, the fact, the point that, you know, you're increasing your rent and decreasing expenses, you're gained equity from the rehab, you gain equity from natural appreciation and you cash flow for five years. If you look at all those things combined and then you take those into account, your return is probably around 30 percent. And that's like <laughs> amazing to consider because you're not getting that in most other investment vehicles. You're definitely not getting that in the S&P 500 or the stock market. <clears throat> and so, but remember when, when I talked about earlier, when I was talking about ROI and you can get, you know, you can increase your ROI and get better returns if you're able to, you know, decrease the amount you invested, right? Because 15.78 is not bad. That's not a bad return, but you can get better. And in order to get better, what you have to do is either you lower your costs or you increase the income, right? It's an equation. Like I said, you have to uh, increase the numerator and you decrease the denominator. Benefit over cost. You increase your benefit, decrease your cost, you're going to increase your ROI. And in real estate, it's a lot easier to lower costs um, than it is to actually lower income, at least in residential. So, or sorry, it's a lot easier to lower cost than it is to increase income, at least when we're talking residential. So in this case, it's a lot easier to, you know, increase your RRI if you just lower your costs. So for me, I mean, in this deal for a particular, if I can take the, you know, total cash invested down by not having to put 20% down, that's going to increase your RRI tremendously. Because mm -hmm. what was that? 20% was $57,000, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if I can avoid paying that $57,000, my RRI is going to be great. So... What we're going to do is kind of close out this episode. And next episode, what we're going to talk about is how we can actually find ways to avoid paying that 20% down payment. So we're next, we're, we're gonna, next episode, we're going to talk about financing deals and how to uh, increase your ROI in that sense. I mean, that was a very in-depth <laughs> example, I would say, to say the least. Yeah. But this is all the stuff that is considered when you ta are talking about uh, purchasing a rental property because there's a lot of different variable expenses that may come up. There's a lot of things you need to take into account to make sure that you're going to have a sound investment. You can't just take the income minus the rent or minus the uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the mortgage. mortgage and say that all right, that's, that's good. That's I'm cash flowing. <laughs> you will you after seeing all the stuff that he just mentioned, you need you would probably be losing a whole lot of money on a whole lot of deals if you just think that's the only metric that you need to take into consideration. But understand also, if you were confused by any of these numbers, it's also going to be on that calculator. So I'm going to have or that, on that spreadsheet. I'm going to have two tabs on there on uh, moneymonopolizers.com slash analysis. One is going to be a flip uh, tab and one is going to be a rental tab. These numbers will all be on there. If you weren't able to follow along clearly, you'll be able to see each one of them laid, each one of these uh deal analysis laid out the flip and the rental that way you'll be able to follow along and see the cash on cash return that alice has been talking about that way you, you have a visual of what a good deal looks like and then you'll have a better understanding of how, how we ran this analysis and then uh like i said before you'll be also be able to imp to change the numbers out and to uh, run your own deals like that as well and use our use our number as a guideline to fit to uh, to know what we're like plugging in so when, when he says something like taxes um he said eight thousand was the ta uh, property taxes for 321 main street it may not be that that much in taxes everywhere like in indiana uh, if you see eight thousand dollars in taxes you probably you might own 10 acres or something that's <laughs> like that you're gonna have a have a whole lot of land to have that much in property taxes but um but that's beside the point just saying that um uh, you'll be able you, you need to know how to put all these numbers into the equation when it comes to analyzing a rental or a flip deal and like i said before it comes that comes uh better with practice facts facts it's great points and um yeah so this was a really you know like i said this episode was very important and you, know, you might be sitting here and be you might feel overwhelmed 
by a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, especially with this latter portion when we talked about the rental property analysis. But that's what it that's what it takes. This is what it takes to make good investments. You got to be able to know these numbers. It's very, very imperative that you're able to <laughs> understand these numbers and know them inside and out. Seriously, you're not you're gonna get cooked if you don't know them well. So I'm just being real with you. So if you you know have any questions, like we said, go back and listen to this episode again. Um, if that still doesn't help, sorry. Uh, just you could you know hit us up and <laughs> I didn't mean to say sorry, <laughs> but you could. <laughs> <laughs> I got some. You, <laughs> you can hit us up and we'll uh we'll try to answer your questions as best as we can. And I mean, I just want to make one more quick comment because I know a lot of people are just overwhelmed beyond belief right now. I promise you, both me and Alice felt the same exact way when we first started uh, uh, studying real estate. Every term that we heard, a cash on cash return on investment, that was a brand new term. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many real estate terms that, that you have out there and it's like in the beginning, you'd ha- you know, nothing. So it's like, once you start learning about it, it's you, you I promise you, it's going to start excelling as far as your learning curve. You're going to start down here knowing nothing, but over time, the more you hear this stuff, the more you're going to uh, start familiarizing yourself with these terms, return on investment. That's classic ARV, just things like that. You're going to hear, hear these same terms over and over because this is exactly how real estate works. So at, over time, it's going to make, make more sense to you. You're going to be more confident confident and you're going to be more successful as a real estate investor but it's all about just staying with it sticking to it like like he said listen to this episode multiple times until it starts clicking in your head because all the numbers here are even though they're just a f- fictional example they're very good as far as understanding what goes into a deal analysis facts facts so yeah shout out to you if you are still here and you are still listening um you're going you you're going to go far <laughs> i hope so, um, but yeah, anyway, that's it for this episode of the Money Monopolizers podcast. New episodes will be released every Thursday and will be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Just search Money Monopolizers wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you learned something of value today. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you rated us and left us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find out more info about us on Twitter at the Monopolizers or on IG at Money Monopolizers. We post informative content on there that'll keep you engaged. So check that out and share those posts. But until then, we out of here. You've been listening to the Money Monopolizers podcast, helping you take control of your financial destiny. To learn more about how you can be in control of your money, visit moneymonopolizers.com. We'll catch you next time when Alex and Marlon share more personal finance and wealth creation tips with you. Now it's time to take action.